so much, so very much for coming today. And I have the deep and distinct pleasure to introduce our MC for the afternoon. Round of applause, please, for Mr. Andrew Oliver. Thank you, thank you all very much. I'm killing already. Uh, my name is Ed Roller. I, uh, I am a student. I can't say was. I am a student of our fan, friend, and mentor, Walt Whitcover. Or as John Travolta referred to him, <laughs> Wyatt Bothelcombe. <laughs> is John here? <laughs> Waltzy, I mean Walt. Um, oh, tell me, wonderful people here. I have to acknowledge. I have to look around the room. And, uh, many of our, uh, of my fellow company six members, of Sony Purchase, are here. Anne, Rusty, Bob, Ed, Tim, so many other students, family members, friends of Walt's. I think even the ghost of Richard Hughes is here. I don't know if you've seen Saul Walt. I'm just still looking at him. Walt, Walt, Walt. So the Bob Saul Walt. Um, what would Walt say about the number of people here to share this with him today? I wonder, what would Walt say about all of the people here? He might say, wow, look at all of these people. <laughs> Where were you during my parlor programs, right? Uh, in Philbert without Soto, but eight people in the house, eh? Some nights are walking on stage and in the audience, and it was a one-man show. <laughs> <laughs> but Walt didn't care about commercial success. We all know any producers here in the house, Walt did not care about commercial success. Uh, he was many things, as well know. He was an actor, director, teacher, author, mentor, producer. But first and foremost in all these things was the artistic success. The craft of acting, singing, storytelling, the journey and the exploration, I think, was more important to Walt than any kind of conventional or commercial success. And all of us, I think, here managed to take a couple of journeys with Walt across the years. He saw everything. Walt went to every show. He loved to watch artists work. He went Broadway, off-Broadway, uh, opera, dance, concerts, readings, cabaret acts. He came to our showcases, our fringe festivals, our staged readings. Show fans, how many people had Walt come to see them in the audience, when Walt was in the audience? Wasn't that the most nervous you ever were? <laughs> that you, ever, you wanted everything to go so bright, you didn't want a pencil coming flying at you from the audience. <laughs> Man, you just wanted that to be the best show for Walt. And, and he, he loved it. He was so complimentary, he would always come. Great, that was wonderful. Why did you do that thing? <laughs> <laughs> the rest of the world, I don't know why I did that. <laughs> but that started at Purchase. I went to see Purchase. Walt taught uh, me uh, and the rest of my company six fans. And that started there. Hi, Loretta. Lisa. Hi. Hello, Luca. Um, I'm easily distracted. Squirrel! <laughs> <laughs> that started, I think, at, at Purchase, doing scenes for Walt. We wanted so much. Not to impress Walt, you, you know, to just to make him notice. If, if I could make Walt laugh in a scene, oh my gosh, that made my whole month. He'd be doing something and he'd be here. <laughs> love that. Love it every moment. But more than that, if you could surprise Walt, because really, how many times had he seen? The glass menageries, the death of the sails, and the middle of the night scenes. But if you could do something that would make him stop, that would make him look up, that would make him stop taking notes for five seconds. <laughs> Remember that sound? I mean, I did one scene. The first line was "Hello, hello." <laughs> you could make him put that pencil down for five seconds. It was a special, special moment. And uh, is Liz here? Liz Larson? 
did not hear, but I remember a scene in particular, this is way back, from Career, one of Walt's favorite scenes I was working on. And uh, Matt Collins and Liz were doing a scene from that, and in the middle of the scene, Matt put Liz's shoe on his foot, which was wearing black fogs or something, and he just slipped that shoe out, and Walt was so delighted, Mom. Because that little gesture showed such an intimate relationship, such a specific couple that wasn't written in the script. And 37 years later, I can still remember Walt's reaction and his delight in seeing that, seeing someone surprised in there. So now I would like to bring up Matt Conlon to do that scene from <laughs> the heart I look at his face. <laughs> now, ladies and gentlemen, Anne Cassidy and Loretta Scott on the scene from Picnic. Ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> <laughs> Lisa and Rusty Girls in the Via Flaminga. Come on, please. <laughs> oh my gosh, that was the weirdest thing. It's working today. <laughs> <laughs> well, Walt, as I said, was many things. Fan, friend, mentor, teacher, and so much more. But how can you describe Walt's spirit, his essence? I asked some of my company's six friends, if they could describe Walt in three words or less. And it was a daunting test, almost impossible. But here are some of the replies. Paternal, nurturing, empathetic, in my corner, mischievous, energized, undaunted, pencil thrower, <laughs> lover of life, champion of culture, and of course, stick around. <laughs> Well, I know all of us wish that Walt could have stuck around a little bit longer. Walt was a very, very generous man, but he was frugal in one area. He only gave us 88 years, and we all wanted so many more. So if you'd all join me now, I would like all of us to follow our intentions, clarify our objectives, Find the through line of the scene, avoid general choices, and continue the celebration of our friend, fan, and mentor, Walt Woodcover. <laughs>
We both auditioned for the same part in Lillian Hellman's Watch on the Rhine. He got the part, and I didn't join his fraternity. <laughs> what an inauspicious beginning of a long friendship. Within three months, <clears throat> the Pearl Harbor bombing occurred, and our ROTC training in field artillery was accelerated and more intense. By the end of 1942, we had both enlisted in the Reserve Corps at Cornell. <coughs> we entered active military service in April 1943 at Camp Upton in Yip Yip Yapink. He complete, we completed basic training in Fort Sill, Oklahoma, in the field artillery. But on KP duty, Private Scheinman scrubbed pots and Private Silverman swatted flies. We each found our own forte. <laughs> and he never forgot, he never forgave me for taking the fly swatter first. <laughs> Due to the Army's obsession with alphabetic order, we were always kept in the same outfit because of the proximity of Scheinman and Silverman. Get it? <laughs> in August in 1945, after the atomic bombing, the Japanese surrendered. So after two and a half years, including 10 months of combat service, we were promptly and honorably discharged in November 1945, and he and I hitchhiked back to Cornell from Little Rock, Arkansas. We were among the first veterans back, housing was scarce, and therefore we became roommates. Um, Wolf was a character, even then. Uh, while waiting in line in the cafeteria to pay for lunch was just an anecdote my daughter asked me to tell. While waiting in line in the cafeteria to pay for lunch, we, he would drink his orange juice and put the glass in his pocket. <laughs> <laughs> they always saw it. Sometimes he put the butter under the bread. Because they charge for butter in the corner. <laughs> for room decor, the two of us hung over a hundred glass bottles on the wall of our room. And um, when we went back for spring break, our landlady took them all down. She thought the wall was coming down in our bottle room. So we replaced the bottles with playbills. You should also know that shortly thereafter, he became my best man, Le Garçon Donner at my wedding to Selma Bax. He was an only child, and therefore Walt Whitcover became Uncle Walter to my three children, all of whom are here this afternoon, and to my eight grandchildren, three of whom are here this afternoon. When my children were born, Uncle Walter memorialized their growing up years with hundreds of photographs, which he lovingly put in albums for birthdays, with complete personal narrative and hand-drawn hand -drawn cartoons. He took them to the Central Park Zoo on weekends and brought them to his apartment on Mulberry Street to clean his apartment. <laughs> He gave him with a feather dust. <laughs> so it was fun. And for lunch, he made spaghetti and homemade sauce from a can. <laughs> he entertained my children, my nieces, my nephews with his two fake pet mice, Trixie and Ernest. And they, they consumed cheese so quickly you wouldn't have known they were not alive. <laughs> and later, Uncle Walter taught my grandson, who's here tonight, to play Pisha Pisha, a card game Walt learned as a child. You enjoy that game? Good. And so, I celebrate, I salute, and I'm delighted to honor this Garçon Donnet.
Uh, next up we have Lenore de Cronin. And Lenore went to Cornell with Walt, is that correct? <coughs> went to Cornell with Walt and also taught at Walt's studio. So Lenore, Lenore de Cronin. because he's been with me all my life, really. Uh, we, yes, met at Cornell. Uh, we were both in love with the theater, and so we were both in the dramatic club. And um, he was a young returning vet, and I was a young undergraduate. <coughs> And he was an impressive whirlwind of action and activity. He latched on to me, I latched on to him. We used to listen to opera together on Sundays. And he taught me so many things about that world that I didn't know. And then he decided that he was going to do a production. It was called Once Upon a Hill, and it was a kind of musical history of Cornell. And it was amazing. It had 50 roles, 50, and it was dance and song, and he cast me in it. So he was really my first theater director. He kept, kept teasing me about the character. I kept asking him what he thought I should do with it. And he said, you're the black widow. You're the sexy black widow. Yeah. I started Cornell at 15. So it was a stretch. <laughs> we became very close friends. And until the point at which, after um, leaving Cornell, we started to um, go our separate ways career-wise. However, when I was reading his book, the last one, um, My Road Less Traveled, it, I discovered it was also my road. Because we experienced all, almost all the same things. Ran with, worked with all the same people. Um, studied with Lee Strasberg. Studied with Herbert Berghoff. Um, went that whole route <laughs> that young actors did at that time. Um, and so we continued to see a lot of each other and be close. Uh, until finally, he, I became uh, a married woman, and then exiled to L.A. for work, <laughs> and um, kind of lost touch with him a little bit, until I came back in 81, and immediately got in touch with him to see what was going on in his life, and there was this magnificent loft, <coughs> and I said, they're urging me to start my workshop here. But I don't know where to put it. And he said, well, you've got a place to put it. And he showed me uh, what he had wrought. Um, and it was magnificent. There was no other space that I know of in New York City that was such a welcoming space for actors, writers, and directors to oil their wheels in a workshop environment. It was magical. That was 81. We were there all through the 80s until a, a short period of time when he, Walt decided he needed the space for his own activities and we had to go elsewhere. But we came back and we were there until, I guess, two years ago. And so I was lucky enough 
to see walk every week. And to be a sort of witness to all of the things that he was doing and all, all of his uh, struggles over getting the first book out and then the second book. What was amazing about Walt was that his brain never stopped. It was an incredible, uh, amazing um, wheel of ideas and activity. And I had an occasion to do something that I hadn't done all, all uh, in his prior life, which was to see him perform. When he did Gilbert Without Sullivan, it was amazing. So impressive. And the many other things that he did with the shows that he did with Lynn. And I discovered he was a really good actor, in addition to being a director that I knew about. At one point, and this was just a couple of years ago, in the workshop, we had a piece of material that we wanted to have read. But we needed a, an older character actor, and we didn't have anybody. And I said, just a minute. And I walked outside and said, <laughs> found Walt in, in his lair. <laughs> and I said, would you consent to, to read this with us? And he said, sure. And my workshop members were blown away. He was our landlord. That was what they knew. But they had no idea that this was really a terrific character actor. It was the kind of gentle dynamo <laughs> that so endeared me throughout his life and mine. There was an occasion when he celebrated with, with all of his people uh, from Masterworks Lab Theater an anniversary at the loft, and he invited me to join. And I saw how much love there was out there for him. A wonderful life, a constructive life, a productive life, but even more important, a life and I can relate as, as a teacher myself, a life that helped people to the point where they needed him and loved him. There was so much love in that room that night. And I feel that there is so much love here. And that makes me very happy. Thank you.